And so imagine if we still had no cell phones, because that's what we're doing with this opiate thing, is the way I see it. We're still using this methadone stuff. We already know what the success is going to be. We know what the failure is going to be. We know what the cost is going to be. We're just taking a little smidgen of the pie away. So what I'm here to present is, what if we opened a new door and it found a new way? And I'm not just going to say everybody smoke weed. There's a certain kind of marijuana that's called uh, a cannabinoid based in the plant called CBD. It's a non-psychoactive cannabinoid. It doesn't get you stoned. It's an anti-inflammatory. It's a painkiller. It prevents nausea. And subsequently, it works amazingly for treatment addiction issues, uh, particularly opiate addiction. Um, I'm not just saying this based on what I think. I'm saying it's based on dozens of studies that have been done by universities, uh, clinical studies done with uh, professors and doctors and whatnot. And I can present this to any of the members here today. So what I'm here to ask is, what if we tried a new approach? What if we went a different direction than what everybody else has been doing for the last 40 something years? And we tried this CBD-based drug. It's something you can grow right here in Maine. It's something that could save DHHS crap tons of money. And if we apply it in the right way, there's a lot of patients that I deal with that come in on 15 different prescription drugs on a daily basis, and they're down to four or five. And that's not just in their head. That's This is real stuff that's happening. So we could save money on this deal. We could possibly make a better impact on successfully treating these addicts. And, we could, and, and, and the other thing nobody's talking about is a lot of these people have, they got their addictions at their doctor's office. They walked in with a broken back or a broken neck. They started on these opiates. They've been on them for 10, 15 years. And they don't know how to go anywhere else other than methadone or suboxone, which are, which are both addictive. They both are narcotics. And if you take too much of them, you die. If you take too much CBD marijuana, you sleep well that night. It fights anxiety, inflammation, the pain that comes with all these problems that these patients have that originally got their addiction based on. And so, you know, what I'm looking for is any of the members out here today that has the courage to step forward and say, let's put an amendment in this bill and let's open a door and let's um, maybe present a test pilot program. I'm, a I'm not asking for money. I'm just simply saying, open the door to DHHS so we can do this test pilot program. Let's lead the nation and possibly go on a whole new track that nobody's done before. And who knows, maybe we'll have incredible success. So that's my case. <laughs> Thank you, Dawson. Awesome. Yeah. You got a chance to pitch it twice. <laughs> What's that? You pitched it twice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> that was a whole pitch. Right. All right. All right. Uh, Brian Gallagher. Nope. Okay, have I got everybody? I got another sheet? Oh, look at that. Well, I was wondering where Andy was. I have one in the back there. So one remaining on the last sheet? No more. No. No. No, no. Yep, yep. No, this is the last sheet. It's the last sheet, but Andy's not the last sheet. No. Good evening, Senator Hamper, Representative Rotundo, Representative Bettine, and members of both committees. My name is Andy McLean. I'm one of the three lawyers who appears um, before you regularly on behalf of the Maine Medical Association. Thanks so much for your patience today. I've been listening um, since you started this morning, uh, first at the office in the last couple of hours here, and it's been a a very moving day indeed. You're getting uh, written testimony from us, which I am not going to read um, at this time of day, but I, I do want to say a couple of things about the MMA's interest in history with these issues. Um, I want to respond to a couple of the uh, issues that have been raised in testimony earlier today, and certainly be prepared to respond to any questions uh, or requests you, for follow-up you may have of us. So, um, first of all, um, you're, you'll see that um, our testimony is given by uh, Dr. Lonnie Graham, and I'm sorry that she couldn't stay this afternoon to give her testimony because she is very well qualified to add a perspective 
um, to uh, that of the other physicians you've heard today. And I am glad uh, that you've heard from a few. I think I saw uh, or heard uh, Dr. Norris's testimony, and, and I saw um, Dr. Dowd and, and Dr. Schaefer present. Uh, Dr. Graham, in addition to being a former state uh, health officer, um, has been dealing with addiction throughout much of her career. Uh, she currently chairs the Public Health Committee of the Maine Medical Association. Um, she also is the director of our Medical Professionals Health Program, which deals with uh, healthcare practitioners, supports healthcare practitioners who are in recovery from substance use disorders. And she's also one of the physicians on uh, the, one of the task forces that you've heard so much about. Um, has a strong interest in the issue. Secondly, um, I want to acknowledge my colleague, Gordon Smith, um, who really has taken the staff lead on this issue and I'm sure would be able to speak much more eloquently, particularly in Q&A, than I will be able to on the issues. Um, but many of you will remember that he, um, he was involved in moderating um, the event last fall on this topic in Bangor with Senator King and Director Botticelli. Uh, he has been involved um, with uh, representatives of the um, U.S. Attorney's Office, the administration, uh, the Attorney General's Office since then in um, developing the concepts of these um, task forces and seeing that they are established and, um, and uh, filled with appropriate folks. Um, he would want me to emphasize the important role that we think they play. I've attached to our testimony um, some further information, including the, the membership lists of these task forces. So I think it's important that, that we all acknowledge that some of the best minds um, dealing with the, with the topic of addiction are involved in working on, and on it, and you'll hear more. Um, lastly, uh, in terms of our interest, um, and I know I'm a poor time, I apologize, but um, we have key relationships with most of the significant medical specialties who deal with addiction. Um, the Psychiatric Association, the Maine Association of Psychiatric Physicians, the Northern New England Society of Addiction Medicine, and uh, the main chapter of the American College of Emergency Physicians, just to name a couple. Um, moving quickly on to several of the issues that have been raised today, the issue of over-prescribing, we would certainly acknowledge that physicians have a role and responsibility here, but it's a larger societal problem. Um, we all know that in, in my lifetime, prescription drugs have taken on a role that, for, for better and worse, that they did not take on in, in previous generations. And we all know that, that far too many people are um, looking for a pill to fix everything that is wrong with their lives. And physicians have been pressured from both angles. They're, they're are, um, constantly being asked um, to uh, not to under-treat or being accused of under-treating pain. Um, I, I'm sorry to fo follow um, Dawson, uh, but uh, with all due respect on, on medical marijuana, I think we would say let the, let the medical evidence carry the day. Uh, I don't believe that there is credible medical evidence that this is an appropriate um, treatment for opiate addiction, uh, but that's for, for you to decide. We've made that point in the past. Lastly, um, the, the prescription monitoring program and um, whether to, quote, require um, participation, I would say to you that for all intents and purposes, um, it is required today. If, if you are a physician who is working with opiate medications, are treating uh, patients with chronic pain, it is the standard of care today for you to be um, querying the PMP. We have been preaching that in our um, continuing medical education programs since about the year 2000, when um, it was a little bit later. The problem, the prescription opiate problem, started about in the late 90s to 2000. The PMP's been around since about 2003, I believe. Um, it is mentioned specifically in um, Joint Rule Chapter 21, which is the joint rule of the five medical licensing boards of, of individuals who have prescriptive authority and talks generally and, and quite 
comprehensively and broadly about the prescriber's um, uh, obligations in, um, in treating patients with, with chronic pain, specifically mentions the, the PMP. And uh, very lastly, I, I, I would mention um, the Cover Me Now Coalition as well, um, the opportunity to accept the further federal funds. I thank um, Amy uh, from AARP for speaking on behalf of the steering committee, of which we are a member. With that, I will stop and respond to any further questions you may have of us. Senator Valentina. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you very much, Doctor, for being with us. And I have a question. We've heard, um, and since you're a medical doctor, I'm looking for the person. Oh, you're an attorney. I thought it could yes. be. Yes. No, that's why I'm. I wish that Dr. Graham was here, but uh, oh, no, please don't, uh, don't ask me any clinical <laughs> questions, other than maybe what I've absorbed in the years. Yeah, that's true. You still are a doctor. Um, I have a question about the Medicare Drug exposed babies today, drug addicted babies, drug affected babies, everybody's calling it by different names. What is the correct name to use? Is there a difference between an addicted baby and an affected baby? And now we were just said, now we're supposed to call them drug exposed baby. Are they all the same? And if the mother is an addict, will the baby be born <coughs> drug addicted or exposed or affected? And how long does it treat to take baby? <coughs> we hear so many hundreds and hundreds of babies, and then everybody's calling them different names. So I, I want that clarified. I'm sorry, I thought you were. Um, I, I appreciate that, and I'll um, I will take that back and see if we can get um, an appropriate answer for you. I've, not specifically with respect to kids, but um, I have learned enough to, that I can tell you that, as I understand it, the proper term. Um, according to the, the DSM, um, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, I think it's called, the, the Bible for um, Diagnosis of Mental Health Disorders, the term is Substance Use Disorder. And I think like most things in the DSM, there are various subsets, or probably a, Substance Use Disorders is probably a broader category that includes um, a number of um, subsets. Expectation. I, that, was, that was clear as much. I, I would like somebody to answer that question <laughs> yeah. before our work session. Well, I'll take that back. <laughs> Sorry about the, the commentary. <laughs> uh, Senator Cates. <laughs> Turning claim. Uh, there's, so it seems to me that there's consensus around the fact that doctors are going to be using the prescription monitoring program for, obvi I guess, obvious reasons. Uh, we now learn it's part of the rules. In fact, if you could get us a copy of that rule, that would be great. But beyond that, do you have any um, data on, on how well it is used now? That is, is it used 90% of the time? Under what, under what circumstances? And if it's not being used as much as, as perhaps any of us would like, is there, is there a harm to the legislature from your perspective putting into law requirement? Um, I, I will try to find more about the, um, you know, the, 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 the data. Um, one of our concerns with um, mandating, I think the first thing I, I would say to you, um, the, the members of the Health and Human Services Committee hear us say this all the time, that we don't, um, we wish that we would not try to legislate the practice of medicine. So we would not prefer a, a statutory requirement that physicians query the PMP. We think that's adequately covered in Chapter 21 <laughs> for those who, um, for whom it's appropriate. Um, I would say, I've probably said to the Health Committee before, that um, it makes no sense to um, require that um, a physician who does not prescribe or touch medications, like a pathologist or a radiologist, um, so a blanket obligation for all physicians to, to do that doesn't make sense. Um, the, the, in terms of uh, how um, well or not it's used, to some extent, as you would imagine with technology today, that depends on 
how easy the system is to use. Today, it's a lot better than it used to be. A physician can designate um, a staff person to, um, to, to do that query and, and so forth. Um, but I, I think one of the points we would make about um, placing further obligations on the staff uh, at um, the department that, that manages this program is that they don't, uh, they don't have a lot of resources. And um, so uh, I think we would urge caution in imposing you know, more obligations on, on us as the regulated community that, the PM, that those who run the PMP are going to have to uh, perhaps have more resources to, to adequately respond. Thank you. Um, Andy, if you hadn't chosen a less honorable profession, I'd do it in as a doctor. I say that. Um, the, um, I'm glad you brought this forward, Dr. Dr. Graham, and, and recognizing the fact that she is um, a member of one of the teams of the task force. And looking through this list, I see a lot of other names, some of whom testified today. Are you pretty familiar with the work of the task force and, and, and the work that they've done? Uh, certainly not as much as, as Gordon, Gordon is, and I, but I, generally speaking, I think they are, they are in the first phase following organization would be. Um, I guess what I'm saying is that, you know, seeing the Dr. Graham's mm -hmm. putting that in the testimony in support of this legislation, <coughs> is it fair to say there's nothing in this proposed legislation that is contradictory? To the work or the proposals that the task force are working on? Certainly not that I'm aware of. Okay, thank you. Representative Friend. Thank you. One of the questions that has come up in some of the work that's been done, at least in the Bangor region, is around the uh, apparent lack of involvement of pharmacists who are part of the Part of the front line, uh, and the PNP would probably I understand that, but to the extent that we're not, there's no law around it, and to the extent that there seems to be a party that's not at the table, uh, and these tables that I've been at, where a lot of people are at, uh, I don't know if the extent to which there are conversations to the, the medical association with um, pharmacists, groups, if there's been any sort of reaching out to figure out how hands can be held to, to sort of make sure there's a, a bulk work against. Um, this. I just, I, I've been, I have not seen a single pharmacist at any event that I've attended, I've been a lot of events, and I just feel like uh, they're, the, they're where the drugs get dispensed. Um, so I, I don't know the extent well, you can comment on their involvement. Well, I'm sure. I, I, um, obviously, I am not going to speak for the pharmacist community. Um, yes. Um, yeah. I'm just yeah. No, no, I, I would say that it, 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 it varies from, um, you know, in geographic location, but um, I know that um, most physicians value um, their relationship with their local pharmacist or pharmacists and value um, the uh, pharmacist double checking. If the pharmacist sees something that they scratch their head, about that they pick up the phone and say, is this really what you, you know, is this really what you meant? Um, we also sit, uh, on, there is a PMP advisory committee that meets on a regular basis and talks about uh, all these issues. Pharmacists are well represented on, uh, around that table. Um, in terms of, um, uh, you know, pharmacy uh, representation here at the legislature and in conversations with us on a regular basis down here, I think I would simply say they don't have the same resources that, that we have. So they're, um, they're not, I mean, in terms of representation. So it's. Um, you know, I'll just say that to Senator Valentino, I was here for years before I realized that Gordon Smith was not a physician. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lori Kramer. Good evening. Good evening. Senator Hamper, Representative Rotundo, Representative T. 
team, members of both committees. Uh, it's dinner hour. Those cookies aren't going to sustain you for too long. I will be very brief. I will not be reading my entire testimony. Uh, my name is Lori Gremlick, and I'm the executive director of the main chapter of the National Association of Social Workers. We uh, practice in a wide variety of settings and address a wide array of societal issues, uh, including but not limited to mental illness and substance abuse. I'm here today in support of LD 1537. You've heard the implications that addiction has on manners. Um, I'll briefly share a story that I just learned about um, within the last five minutes, thanks to social media. A very, very good friend of mine has a 22-year-old adult daughter who is addicted to opiates. She's been addicted since 10th grade. She um, has gotten into problems with the law, had spent two years at Long Creek as a juvenile, um, has been arrested again, and could not find a bed or placement for um, her rehabilitative services in the state of Maine, and will be going to California for um, treatment. That's an aside that I just learned about, but I think it also illustrates um, the issues that we've been talking about here all afternoon. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about um, some of the resources relative to um, prevention and treatment. We know that research indicates that every dollar spent on substance abuse treatment saves $4 in health care costs and $7 in law enforcement and other criminal justice costs. The benefits of investing in prevention and treatment for substance abuse and use disorders are substantial. Um, we applaud the presiding officers in the legislature for working together to craft this very important and timely piece of legislation. And while enforcement is a very important aspect, I would like to voice our explicit support at NASW of this proposed legislation specific to the allocation of funds relative to prevention and treatment, both of which are critical components in this equation. I will also echo what others before me have said relative to Medicaid expansion as an avenue to pay for um, these services. I will reference not only in my written testimony um, an additional um, couple of pieces that I've included. One is a fact sheet from the Office of National Drug Control Policy, which talks more about prevention costs. And the other is a policy statement from our national affiliate in DC, um, Social Work Speaks, that talks about um, issues relative to social work and substance abuse. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Questions from committees? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Will, come on back up. Good evening. Um, uh, my name is Will Nielsen. I'm from Appleton. And, uh, the St. George River Valley, Northern Knox County. Um, first of all, I want to thank all the different chairs, Senator Rotundo, Senator Camper, Senator Team, and Absentia, obviously, Senator Brakey, um, and all the other folks who worked so hard at different times over the last uh, few years to work on medical marijuana issues and all of the scourge issues that are facing our people. Um, it's ironic that this is a big fight about money because, once again, I just want to emphasize this. Three years ago, we came to the Department of Health and Human Services Committee, some of you no doubt will remember this, with a specific bill. It was very specific. We wanted to be able to have a qualifying condition added. There were two conditions on added. The first was opiate, pharmaceutical, and synthetic drug addiction and dependence. We wanted to be able to treat with medical marijuana. And the second was post-traumatic stress syndrome. And of course, ironically, it's too bad Andy ran off. Otherwise, I'd, I'd give him the credit that he and Gordon deserved for making sure that, in fact, that was stripped out of that bill. They insisted. They did not want that in that bill if it was going to get passed. And the irony is, of course, that's given three more years of momentum in the state for this addiction scourge to build. And this crisis is now a fever pitch. And as people fight about money, I would like to remind you that all the caregivers who spoke today don't charge who are dependent for the marijuana they use to try to help get them off of it. The great thing about the medical marijuana law in the state is that it's legal for patients and caregivers to exchange that medicine freely among themselves. So you see, there's, there's actually no way that the state and the taxpayers end up responsible for that medical marijuana cost. You see? So we've been doing this successfully now for well over a decade in Maine. We are asking that you finish the job we have come to this legislature politely, honestly, with integrity and grace for over five years now and asked you to pass legislation. And the vast majority of the time, 
the people on the committee here, the Department of Health and Human Services Committee, I want to be honest, not all your folks I've always worked with, but Mr. Stuckey's been here since the beginning. Mr. Katina, I remember, uh, you've always been receptive. You've always respected our community. And uh, to be honest, that one thing in that one bill is the only way I feel you've ever failed our community and our state, and I'm sorry to say that. But the reality is now, you have the opportunity. No less than the Senate President has demanded in the media alternative ideas. And so we returned again today to remind you that we have already forwarded ideas. These are not, you know, the MMA can say as much as they want, they want science. The reality is it's been a federal crime for decades to do any tests on marijuana in this country. So that is a really hollow argument, for, in my opinion. When, when, when I'm burying kids in Knox County because they tried to boot Dilaudid or because they tried to boot Oxycontin and they're just too numb to know that it doesn't work that way, and we've got people dying all over the state, and we want to be able to legally give people this treatment. It is amazing to me that we are allowing these influences to commodify the suffering of tens of thousands of our citizens. And I would ask you all to strongly consider amending this bill to include opiate, pharmaceutical, and synthetic drug dependence treatment as a qualifying condition for medical marijuana. Thousands of people's lives will not only be restored, but I would argue saved. And we'll be happy to document that and be able to show everyone how many lives have been changed. I would really appreciate it. If any of you are interested, please let me know. I'm sure the hearing will be over promptly. But you know, we've waited three years politely, and we've lost hundreds and hundreds of people in this state. It's high time that people finish that job. You know, the MMA is a respectable organization. I'm not trying to say they're not. But it's unfortunate that they stepped in the way of progress three years ago and that they've been holding back this opportunity for us to be saving thousands of lives in the state. Thank you. Questions? I'm not sure there are one. Okay. Thank you. And last on my list is Heather Curtis. Hi, thank the, you. The patient. Um, I, I wasn't intending to speak today. I came to stand in solidarity. Um, as a recovery ally, um, but I, I want to thank you all for staying and for slogging it out, and that is the core of service to the, the people of Maine in whom all power is inherent. And I want to especially thank my Senator, uh, Senator Cates. Um, I've, I moved, my, my, my grandmother's from the, the Kennebec, and I moved back, grew up in the mid-coast, but um, I've been really pleased to be your constituent, and thank you all for staying. Um, I, I first testified before this legislature back in, or not this one, but in, in uh, 2000 for about lead poisoning prevention. And I've got five children, and I've had a lot of opportunity to learn about the brain and how it develops and how it deals with trauma and how it, it moves forward. And I also have many, many friends, Wally, again, I've been, I'm fortunate not to have substance abuse issues myself. I have so many friends, whether it's alcohol or prescription medication that they, they started for pain and, and can't put down, or whether it's heroin or cocaine, it's, it, there's, there's, the thing about the recovery community that I've come to realize is that whether people find their way out through a, a faith epiphany or through yoga or through uh, medical marijuana, it, it's about that shift from, from what I call the curse of damned respectability, and some people have called it shame, into the recovery culture where we realize that of course we're not perfect, we're all part of an organism, we're all a messy bunch of people, and if we don't work together, we're not going to get anywhere. And what I've noticed about that shift that happens in people when they move from a place of addiction to a place of recovery is that it's a rewiring of the brain. It's a rewiring, it's a, it's a shortening of that distance between the synapses. And it's documentable, obviously, you know, that, so the electrical impulses need to, to not go as far. And so I'm a medical marijuana patient for my migraines and also for trauma recovery. 
And my 22-year-old son is a medical marijuana patient because he had a, a brain tumor uh, at, at 21, he's 22 now. And it prevents his, his brain tumor coming back. And we were actually were really surprised pleasantly that both his neurologist and his neuro-oncologist were so on board with his use of medical marijuana. And one thing that, that we realized in this whole process is that it supports that sort of neuroplasticity, that rewiring of the brain. And what I really, you know, it, there's, it, it really creates an encouraging soup in the brain for it to, to make that, those little journeys less long and tedious. And I just, I just really encourage you as well to support the work of the medical marijuana community, which is not based in commodification and was not, you know, the pharmaceutical industry all came, came out of IG Farben after World War I, wondering what to do with their mustard gas and how can they commodify these chemicals. And, you know, the, this plant has been with us, has co-evolved with us over millennia. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I've gotten everybody in the room, right? And I will close the public hearing. Oh, well, yeah, I, I'll close the public hearing, and then you can do your addresses. Okay. There we go. Yeah.